your writing career, Har Tree. Alrighty. So welcome to this interview by, uh, with Horror Tree Magazine. I'm Ivana Sanders, also known as The Novelette, and we're so thrilled to be able to chat with you today about your new release, October Nights. Well, thank you for having me here. I'm looking forward to it. Great. Me too. Alrighty. So how are you doing this evening? Uh, doing well. Doing well. Uh, you know, uh, during the school week, so a full day of teaching, and uh, my daughter had a soccer game tonight, so yes. finally home and relaxing. Good, very good. That's excellent. I'll go ahead and start the question. Okay. All righty. So you are the author of October Nights. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your new release? Sure. Uh, October Nights is a, a Halloween uh, collection. It's a collection of four novellas um, with, a, with a wraparound story um, that all take place, you know, end up taking place on Halloween night or in, in the days leading up to Halloween. Um, all of my books take place in a uh, fictional town of my own creation. So October Nights is the, the latest installment in that, uh, in that series. And all the stories take place in the same town. Uh, they don't need to be read in any order, but you do notice little connecting elements here and there between the stories. Good. That sounds so intriguing. I'm very excited to, to, read, to read that. Um, and it, it's so cool because I'm an anthology editor and publisher. So okay. I, I love story co short story collections. And um, I also have a book set it, uh, during Halloween time in 1995. So I, I end up gravitating to uh, thrillers, uh, dark fiction, things like that. Um, and recently I got into short story collections too. So you're the second short story author I've interviewed recently. Right. And I'm really glad to be able to. Very cool. Wonderful. So for your, in, in your personal opinion, what would you say? Coffee or tea? Um, I would go with neither. Yeah? I'm an energy drink guy. <gasps> ah, I see. I like the energy drinks, yep. What's your favorite? Uh, Monster. Definitely Monster, Monster, Monster Low Carb. Cool. Very cool. <laughs> I don't think I've ever actually tasted one. I think I've tasted Red Bull one time. It's not the best tasting one. I remember when they first came out and I tried Red Bull and I didn't really like it. But one, once I tried the Monsters, I enjoyed those. Almost. They have a better flavor. Is that, 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 that makes me curious now. I might have to try it. <laughs> cool. So what do you hope is the takeaway for readers of October Nights? Well, you know, it's a Halloween collection, but um, most of the fiction that I write about, you know, even though it's classified as horror or it's supernatural, you know, most of it is centered around, you know, human beings trying to resolve uh, their demons, their conflicts, you know, things they're struggling with. So I'm hoping that even as they're fun, you know, Halloween-y stories, that the stories are also dealing with people that are trying to find resolution for their problems or the, the, the burdens they're carrying, you know, uh, and I, I hope there's a lot in there about you know, um, forgiveness or regret or the consequences of, of actions and things like that along the way, just, you know, being good Halloween fun. Well, that's wonderful. I like that a lot. So it's like um, there's some human elements to it, not just, not just totally scary, but there's some human elements and, and some uh, so it kind of captures a little bit of the human condition. That's, that's really what most of my horror fiction is about. You know, I, I love horror of all kinds, but as a writer, I've always lean toward yes this is horror but we really wanted to exp you said it perfectly you know exploring aspects of the human condition cool so what draws you to the horror genre you know um it's it's an interesting question because as a kid i i read everything um i wouldn't have said i was a horror fan as a kid just because i didn't really know much about horror as a kid you know i I, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. The most I knew about horror were, were slasher films that I knew at that point that didn't interest me. I, I initially wanted to be a science fiction writer. You know, yeah. I liked science fiction. Um, but around my mid-20s, you know, I kind of entered uh, an, uh, a time of personal struggle for myself. And I realized that science fiction, the science fiction novels that I kept reading, they weren't really asking the same questions that I had about life, you know. And I remember yeah. that. The first Stephen King, the first horror novel that I read was a, a Desperation by Stephen King. 
you know, and it, it was amazing to me, ha never having read horror before, that yes, this is a horror novel, it's got all the aspects of a horror novel, but it's also asking all these like, deep philosophical existential questions. And, and for me at that time period in my life, it just seemed like horror was asking the questions that I was asking, you know, about life. And I, and I, like I said, horror is not for everybody, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And everyone has their own genre they like, but I know for me, you know, again, horror that, that, that uh, explores the human condition and asks the questions that I, that I ask myself on a daily basis, you know, why do bad things happen? Why do these things happen to certain people, yeah. you know, uh, that sort of thing. I, I don't know. I do like the pulpy aspect of horror. I mean, I, I like good stuff, but then I like a really bad, cheesy B movie too. So yes, <laughs> they both they but they both very entertaining. Um, but I like it when horror does uh, ask those tough questions and has the philosophical meanings and undertones to it. I find that to be uh, when horror is at its strongest, and yes. I really I really appreciate what it can do culturally. I think that's just fascinating. Same thing. Yeah, I, I uh, teach high school English and every year at this time I always teach a unit on the horror genre and a lot of my kids are fascinated and surprised because the most they know of horror is, is what Hollywood has done to it. You know, and then when I show them the historical roots and, and up through the generations that their eyes are opened a little bit that like, like this is more than just, uh, you know, chainsaws and hockey masks. This, <laughs> this is like any other literary genre it talks about what it means to be a human. Yes, that's true. That's very true. So what does the act of writing mean to you? You know, um, th there's, a, there's a lot of different answers to that question. Um, on the very base level, I just, there's something just pleasing about it. You know, I've, I've always been a writer. I think it was eighth or ninth grade. I started like writing things down in notebooks and things like that. And, and uh, college wasn't, I mean, college is always hard, but I know what helped for me in college is I've always just simply liked the act of writing. There's, for whatever reason, there's just something that intangible. Some people like to knit. For me, you know, I like uh, just like writing. But when it comes to writing fiction, um, you know, there's a, it's kind of a melding of, one hand, it's just a lot of fun to make stuff up, right? But on the... On the other hand, again, it's kind of become my canvas for here's all the stuff I wrestle with all the time. Here's all the questions that I don't have answers to. Here's the things that I'm afraid of, which as a 47-year-old father of two, the things I'm afraid of are a lot different than the things I was afraid of when I was like 25. Yeah. Um, so it's that melding of, hey, this is just a lot of fun. But also, too, I, this is stuff like, it's my opportunity to take all that stuff that's in here and just kind of throw it out here and work it out. You know, people, and I wouldn't say that all of my stories are reflections of me, because obviously that's where that creative process begins, where you have this thing inside of you and you turn it into something else. So not every story can be like a biographical reading of me. But just being able to work, I like, I don't know, why is the world like this? Why are people like this to each other? You know, it becomes very cathartic. Yeah, I definitely, I can definitely relate to that so much. It, a lot about writing is just self-fulfilling for me. Because I just doing it is, is pleasing somehow, even if nothing comes of it. Even if I don't, you know, have that particular story published. Or I, even if I want to seek publishing for a particular story, um, it's just, it's just fulfilling to even just put it down on paper and see it come together, see right. the narrative come together, um, uh, develop the characters and flesh them out. Yes. And, yes. It, and exploring them does help me to explore, you know, humanity even. It's like yes. it, through, through them, I find more of myself and I help, it helps me understand others. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that so much. So in your opinion, what is the best, TV or movie adaptation of a book? It could be any genre. Oh, it, it's going to have to be a tie. Okay. Uh, the first one is going to be, have to be Stand By Me, uh, oh. which of course is an ad adaptation of, of the novella The Body by Stephen King. Mm -hmm. um, my second um, uh, vote is going to be the, the Netflix series The Haunting of Hill House. Oh. Uh, uh, simply because of 
it's not a straight adaptation. In fact, it's not anything like the novel at all. But Mike Flanagan did such a brilliant job of taking the, the novel, The Haunting of Hill House, with, which is a seminal novel. It's a canonical novel that every horror uh, fan should read. And he made something so new of it that still had the DNA of that novel. It's just, it's, I've watched that series at least two or three times now. Wow. And it's just absolutely amazing. It's like he uh, was inspired by it. It was still honored it but reimagined it all at the same time exactly it's a beautiful reimagining that completely honors the novel absolutely cool i like that that sounds really intriguing i have heard of that series i've never watched it i didn't know it was based on a book yeah the haunting of hill house by shirley jackson but the he just took the premise and just ran with it and it's a complete reimagining but it's a wonderful series cool makes me interested I'm sure that the viewers will be very interested, too. <laughs> um, my favorite is definitely uh, The Silence of the Lambs. and oh, the Shaw that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. And the, Sa the Shawshank Redemption. Oh, it's such Ooh. a good one. That's a good one, too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Those are my two favorites. But I'm always, so, I'm always so curious to hear what others think of different adaptations. And it also makes me, it helps me know of other books that have been adapted that I might want to read someday. Like The Haunting, the, the, the one you just Haunting mentioned. Haunting Hill House. Yes. If I, if I could throw out a third, I would also, I would also mention Dr. Sleep. Dr. Ooh. Sleep. Yes. Dr. Sleep was excellent because Mike Flanagan had a real tough job there because The Shining, the novel, is not anything like The Shining, the movie uh, with Jack Nicholson. Yeah, and then yeah. the novel, Dr. Sleep, that Stephen King wrote is a sequel to the novel, not the movie. But somehow, again, Mike Flanagan is so good at honoring the source material, but then making something that's uniquely his. So I'll, I'll throw Dr. Sleep out there, too. Ewan McGregor was just amazing in that film. Cool. I, guess I, I, I have seen Dr. Sleep. Um, I haven't read the book, though. So it makes me really curious to see the similarities. It's actually better than the books. One of those rare cases where it's better. I like I like Doctor Sleep, the novel, but the movie just had, especially with a a rose hat. I mean, and she's got to be one of the best villain cinematic villains that I've seen in the last couple of years. Oh, and Misery is one of my favorites. Also. Oh yeah. Oh yep. yes, yes. <laughs> As we talk, it's like oh, more and more coming to me that are my favorites. <laughs> So what advice would you give to amateur writers about crafting a story that hooks? Crafting the what? Crafting a story that hooks. Oh, that hooks crafting the reader. a story that hooks. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that when you're in the writing process and you really want to hook the reader, you, you want to... Um, this is going to sound like weird advice. And this is maybe only just happens to me. A lot of times I'll write and write and write and write. And I'll write like three or four or five, six pages. And suddenly I'll come to the epiphany that 10 pages later, this is where the story really starts. It's where the story really actually got interesting. Mm -hmm. And then I think to myself, I don't want to throw out those nine pages. But once you throw out those nine pages, you realize that story right here, yeah. this is where it starts. And I, I always like to start my stories um, very often in media res, you know, where we're either dropping right in the middle of a situation or we're starting right out with dialogue, which again, that, that sometimes will come, I'll write 10 pages of all this expository backstory. And then I'll realize that those 10 pages didn't go anywhere. Now suddenly on page 11, here it is. Here's the beginning. I think when the story starts, ex gets exciting for you, that's where the story should start. Yeah. And maybe, maybe you needed to write those 10 pages to get them out of your system or to sort the character out in your head. But when you're suddenly like, ah, here it is, that's where the story should start. Yeah. So that the readers, and that's, my, that's just my take on it, then the readers are going to hopefully feel the same thing that you're feeling. Because if, if you're not excited about your writing, <laughs> the readers are not going to be excited either. True, very true. I, um, I, I think that's a really good, I think it's a really good piece of advice, especially when it comes to amateur writers, because a lot of amateur writers aren't comfortable with editing and that, and cutting things out. And yes. sometimes it's, it's your baby. That's yeah. your baby. You get, you know, every, and I've, I've been there where every single word is gold. This yeah. is my masterpiece. How <laughs> dare you tell me to take the scene? <laughs> 
but yeah. kill your darlings, kill your darlings, get get rid of them. Yeah. That is true. It's like it it it, it seems painful at first, but it betters it in the end. Yep. And that's an evolving process. Even today, I'm still learning today where I'll be I'll be going through the second draft and go, this is killing me, but this whole chapter does nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it's gotta go. <laughs> that's the action grinds to a halt. Maybe I'll take this. And, and writers are pack rats too. Just because you cut that chapter out doesn't mean you can't use it for another story somewhere else. Yeah. I have a whole junk file that's partials as slices, but it, but I still, even today, I'd be like, this has got to go. Me too. It's like if I cut it down, I do have to put it somewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have to at least exactly. store it somewhere else. Maybe I can yep. use it in a sequel later on, foreshadowing, or in a whole different story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yep. <laughs> Great advice. I think it's wonderful advice. So what character of October Nights was hardest to write and why? Okay, so there is a, uh, one of the novellas is called The Last Will and Testament of, not, of the Not-So-Good Reverend Ford. Uh, okay. And it's the um, imagining of a pastor who's fled his church and fled his family uh, because of his eldest daughter's death. Uh, okay. And uh, it was, uh, you know, because of the extreme feelings of guilt that he didn't do enough to protect his daughter, that he didn't do enough to help her, that as a pastor, yes, he was concerned about his congregation and his standing in the church community, but he just ignored everything that was happening with his daughter until it was too late. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I'm, I'm not in the ministry or anything like that, but having a daughter, you know, uh, being a, of the Christian faith myself, um, you know, and everything that's kind of going on in Christianity right now, that was hard to write because it's just, you know, it's tapping into that, you know, I, I missed the forest for the trees. You know, I had this obligation in my church and to act like a Christian to hear my daughter has suffered for it because of it. Now I feel responsible. So at times that was very, very difficult to write. And I put it this way, all the, uh, all the angst I have about the way organized religion, especially uh, institutionalized Christianity is played out, especially as we've seen it played out in the last two or three years, it got poured yeah. all into that story. All into that story. <laughs> yeah, well, that sounds very intriguing. And I, I can agree with so much of what you just said, totally, because I'm in seminary school. I'm actually, a, uh, I, I have a bachelor's degree in psychological counseling with an emphasis on theology. And I, oh, cool. thank you. And I'm getting my master's degree now uh, in, in a, a seminary school, but I'm getting it in media and arts. And okay. I so appreciate the school that I'm at now is so much different than the school that I came from. So the school that I came from definitely adheres to that almost eerie, scary type of Christianity that we've seen recently. <laughs> I, I went to Bible. I went to Bible college for two and a half years, and that's kind of what it was like. And this was back in the '90s, so like you know, there was a dress code. If you got caught going to the movies, you got fined. It was it was a little crazy. Yeah. Yeah, the school I came from was very much like that, and I did not like that at all. And it just it captured everything that I think that people despise about Christianity, right, rightfully so. And the school that I'm at now, it's so much more progressive. And I definitely yeah. appreciate that. I think that they are like the future of Christianity. I think awesome. that they are the, I think they're, they're a, 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 ray, a, ray, a breath of fresh air and a ray of light. Awesome. And awesome. I love it so much. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so I think, I think it's really great. It's, um, it definitely is better reflective of the character and the nature, I think, of, of what scripture tells us. Good. Great. Yay. <laughs> um, so do you have stories on the back burner that are just waiting to be written? And if you can share, uh, what can we anticipate from you in the future? Okay. Back stories that are on the back burner. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll go with one that's not even written at all. Um, and again, when it comes to my inspirations for horror, um, I'm very much insp inspired by what I see and where my mind goes with this. So I have in mind another collection of novellas mm -hmm. uh, that takes place um, at the ruins of an old um, basketball camp. And actually, one, one of the stories in October Nights, Long Night in the Valley, does take place there. 
Um, and there's a story behind that because in high school, before I started writing, I played basketball, I played college basketball. And all through high school and college, I worked at a basketball camp over the summer, you know, the whole summer. And recently, not recently, but the last three or four years, it was really weird. I started having dreams about this camp and things like that and showing up and having it being abandoned. And it was an, such an important part of my life. So I started drafting this idea of a series of stories. And of course, the basketball camp is on the outskirts of this fictional town that I've created. And I started dra dra drafting a, a, like a collection where different people through different time periods, the first novella would be a, a girl going to the basketball camp when it was still working and uh, down the history to when it was abandoned. Um, you know, and uh, that just got kind of moved aside for other projects. Long Night in the Valley is in, uh, is one of those basketball camp stories. Um, and again, it seems weird because people are like, not a basketball camp, basketball, it's not necessarily something that you think horror, but, I, but what happened is three or four years ago, I decided to actually go visit this camp just randomly one day, and it indeed had been abandoned. Yeah. And it just looked so strange, it just looked so strange, like, it, there was just like, it was like everyone had just gotten up and walked out, yeah. and there was stuff everywhere, and so that's what started, and that's been pushed a lot away to a, a further date. Um, right now I'm currently finishing, uh, a novel, uh, called Pleasant Brook, which is going to be another Halloween novel. Uh, it may, I've got several novels in different stages of completion. This one might actually be the first one to get out because I've mostly just written short story collections. The other novels are a little bit more complicated. This is a bit of a departure for me because it's just a Halloween thriller. Yeah. With, with monsters devouring a small town. Cool. Um, so I'm hoping that will be out by, by next year. Um, and uh, I've, I've, the other one that's going to be going to agents is actually a weird Western. Ooh. It's a weird Western with Billy the Kid and flesh eating monsters. Ooh. So, they remind you know, me, what's the, that? It reminds me of The Hills Have Eyes. Just, just yeah. hearing the first, the first like sentence about it kind of reminds me of that a little bit. So the hills with the eyes with cowboys, uh, uh -huh. you know, in, in six shooters. Uh -huh. um, but that was that's about ninety k. Uh, it's been through many drafts. It's also be the first book in a series. So we're gonna set that aside and and go on the fabled agent hunt and try to find an agent for that. Wonderful, and maybe some pitch events on Twitter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Very cool. I have a, a huge list of horror. Um, are publishers if you'd like me to send it to you or anything like that That'd i just i've done a lot i've done a lot of stuff in editing and publishing for quite a few years so i have just this collection of information like i'd love to share with anybody <laughs> great, awesome. Thank you. great. I'll, I'll email it over okay so that was our that concludes our final question for the interview but i'm going to ask you one more question just okay. to close where can we find out more about you and your book october 9th and your upcoming release. Okay, um, so I, I do have a, a website, uh, even though nobody goes to websites anymore. Uh, it's kevinlucia.blogspot.com, okay? Um, or you can just add me on Facebook or Twitter. Yeah, you know, Kevin B. Lucia on both Facebook and Twitter, and add me there, uh, you know, and that's, that's where I post all my stuff all the time anyway, so yeah. Well, I'll go follow you, especially me. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Well, we're so happy to have you on this episode with Horror, with Horror Tree Magazine, um, Mr. Kevin Lucia. And we're very happy and excited to be able to have you on. And we all look forward to reading your books in the first one being October 9th. Okay, thank you. I hope you enjoy.